Hello and welcome to this uh, next uh, Google Plus um, Hangout, Ask Us Anything. We're encouraging people to join us and ask us anything. Unfortunately today we've got no um, <laughs> external non root sixes to ask us anything, but we've got some good uh, topics to go over. Um, but just once around the table, um, my good colleague Rupert Watson, where are, you, where are you coming from today Rupert? It looks rural. I'm in the half-timbered house in the, in the, where, where they've got the Death Watch beetle twitting away in the background I'm afraid. But so this is Route um, 6, I'm, very I'm west. From home. Right, jolly good. Shirking from home, east, mate, east. Drinking from home. Gone east, man. Oh, of course. Sorry, no. In <laughs> You're in Norfolk. What was I thinking? <laughs> I thought you were in Wales. And on the other input, um, our splendid colleague, Mr. David Skeggs. What up, Skeggs? Good morning. Hello. You're right. Yeah. And you're drinking from home, uh, working from home as well. I am indeed. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm the he only person. Out the window. I'm the I'm the only person who's actually in a, a Route Six premises. I'm at the workshop. Uh, we've got our guys um, next door preparing a um, a big a big one two eight squared matrix for uh, the guys at the frame store. I'm just glancing at to make sure the wiremen are wiring. Looks like they are. Um, and um, uh, you know, it's all it's all go. And that's the kind of oversight you can expect from a Route Six project. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, and look, here's Joel, Joel Gilbert. Fantastic. How are you, man? Your microphone is muted. Unmute yourself. Right. Hello, everyone. Hey. hey, hey. It's Captain Joel Gilbert. How you doing? Yeah, yeah. What's up, Holmes? What can you tell us? Uh, well, I, I feel very left out because I haven't got a fancy, like, lower third. <laughs> hey. Oh, we can talk you through that. <laughs> we must do that another time. What have you been talking about? We're about to kick off, Joel. Uh, our subjects today are going to be um, Sony OLEDs. A bit of a return to it because we talked about it in a previous Hangout. But um, uh, I've been monkeying around with the, 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 the current uh, second gen A250, the, 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 uh, the PVM A250. So the, the sort of five grand Sony OLED rather than the 20 grand BVM. Um, and I'm really impressed. So I'll talk a bit about that. I was also going to. How much is it, sorry? Uh, it's in the province of £5,000. Um, so, uh, as far as we're concerned, we'd really like people to start buying them as opposed. <laughs> Go on. So, so we we sell a lot of uh, Panasonic as uh, uh, JVC uh, DTV twenty four series um, LEDs, which yeah. I normally tell people they're kind of grade one and a half. You can get the color quite good. The blacks are a challenge, as they always are for LCDs. Um, but they're very fully featured monitors, and they're a real workhorse. Lots of people use them, um, but um, they kind of they kind of come in at four thousand pounds, something like that. Um, but the OLEDs, the Sony OLEDs, the the the, the, the PVM series, the, which the A two fifty is the current. Um, I think they're excellent. I think they're as good as anything under twenty thousand pounds, and I can't see the difference between that and the the BVM. Uh, the BVM, which we've had in on test before, colorimetry identical to the the PVM. Um, I think it's more down to the fact that the, the, the PVMs still only come with a year's warranty, whereas the BVMs come with three years of warranty. And I think that's, that's where the story is, because we're, nobody's still quite sure how long the blue elements of, of OLEDs are going to last for. So I think, mm. actually, the, the 20 grand is actually Sony hedging their bets and saying... So when, do we, when do we think... When do, I mean, we continue to say that. At what point are we going to know? What, what, what is the sort of time scale for knowing what's going to happen to the blue element? Uh, well, personally, I don't know. I've not, I've not been able to get back to a monitor that I did that I calibrated a year or more ago. So I don't know. Um, uh, mm. I, I, I don't know of anybody who's saying, "Oh, flipping out my my PVM series that I bought or my, or my OLED that I bought two years ago when they were just kind of coming out is now going yellow." I don't. I, I, you know, I've just haven't heard that. So uh, right. Yeah, it's all a bit apoc apocryphal at the moment. Right, chaps, I'm just going to duck out briefly and help the wife. I'll be back in about a couple of minutes, and I'll take that call that just came in. <laughs> do, I, on... do I mute, or should I leave it running? Uh, mute yourself, I'll if leave... you'd be so kind, uh, and, and, but, 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 but leave it running. Uh, it's tweeting. Um, so, Phil, tell, yeah. tell me how it went at um, 4K Arsenal. Okay, well, that's what I rang you about. That's what I rang you about yesterday. Okay, well, can I, I get to that in a little bit. It was very interesting. Actually, it was a really good weekend. Although I worked kind of long, long hours, sort of seven in the morning till nine in the evening, um, it really was a good time. And I kind of, I always forget how much I love OBs and, and live stuff and that. But uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about um, the uh, the Sony OLED. So give me a moment. I'm just gonna share a share a screen. So. Um, 
So here we go, Sony's website, the uh, the PVM A250, which is their second gen of their kind of cheapy OLED, so the the five thousand pound OLED, and the BVM is the is the expensive one. Um, uh, this is uh, it's a very nice package. You know, it comes with all the things you expect from a monitor now. You know, there's a D embedder in there. Um, it's it's got all the kind of um, uh, uh, you know, features as far as um, markers go and all that kind of stuff. So very capable monitor. But aside from that, the the colorimetry is just sort of bang on. Now I'm I'm just bringing up a, a little page here from my blog. Now this is so Wesley, my trainee, who I'm getting up to speed with with calibrating monitors and stuff. Um, one of the things we wanted to know was whether the calibr ca the colorimetry of the monitor tracked between um, the YUV four two two HDSDI input and the and the RGB HDMI input, and so this is, if I, if I bring up this screen grab from the color probe, this is... a small typo there. Sorry, say again, Joel? I see a small typo on your webpage there, it says H HMDI. Oh, that's, right, that's, the new, that's the new standard. It is. Where, where have you Where have you been, man? <laughs> not up to date, chaps. Look, look so, at the pictures, look at the pictures, not the words. <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 all about the colours. So so this is a screen grab from the um, from the new Klein probe we had. And if you want to know a bit more about that, you can go back to. Um, the first hangout we ever did we talked a lot about um the climb probe in that but this is so this is the um this is the monitor out of the box before we calibrated it um and you can see it's pretty damn close it's the kind of the fashion for 100 candelas per meter squared for white point rather than 80 which is kind of the bbc standard but but i mean the ebu so 100 to be honest you can't really tell the difference 100 is obviously a bit brighter um but uh, so the white point out of the box is a tiny bit wrong not hugely but it's a tiny bit blue and again that's something of a fashion but but it's it's very easily calibratable it's very easy to get the the red dot right in the middle of the box which is where uh, d6504 is meant to live and and so this is out of the box the hdsdi input and uh if i go to the next graphic this is out of the box uh rgb hdmi input with the same white field <coughs> excuse me so you can see that they really have got the um, the RGB YUV um, uh, color transposition exactly correct because there is no difference between the color of the the, the, the monitor um, with a, with an RGB input and the color of the monitor with a YUV input, and that's traditionally been a problem, particularly it has to be said with JVC monitors with um, with Panasonic DCV series monitors. Um, the thing you can notice is there's a tiny bit of a of a luminance offset between the two inputs. I mean, you know, like. An awful lot less than one candela per meter squared. You won't be able to see that, but uh, but, but but it just kind of almost confirms to you that the uh, the two inputs, you know, we're looking at two different inputs rather than the same input. So um, HMDI, you're exactly correct, Joel. <laughs> um, so so that's that's kind of my little observation of of what we've discovered so far on on the newest sort of second gen uh, Sony uh, PVMs. Very impressed, you know, really really nice monitor, and um, it's a keen price. It's quite a keen price as well. It is, and as I so, so, so I've I've not been able to find anything, um, uh, uh, you, you know, sub sort of high teens that competes with it. I think Sony will clean up, uh, with the exception of the very cheap end. I think I think you know that PVM suits everybody. Now the Flanders Scientific monitors, I've not had a chance to play with those yet. I hear good things about them. I just don't know much about that range at all. Have you guys come across that at all? No, no if you had a look at the is it the X three hundred or three thousand in the PVM range for the Sony monitor? Is that their four K one, isn't it? I think. Uh, it, it is. I haven't paid any attention to it at all. The pro problem with four K monitors because that's still um, LCD rather than OLED, isn't it? I believe from memory. Yeah, I think it's derived from their LMD series monitors. Uh, I'm, I'm right. just kind of riffing now. I don't really know it at all. Uh, yeah, so Arsenal. I'll, I'll tell you a funny little thing uh, uh, happened at Arsenal. Um, I've just got to find a uh, 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 a picture. Um, uh, it was great. It was a really nice weekend. Um, those, those guys are brilliant because um, they they're not afraid to spend the money. And they've got they got they've got a bit of money, haven't they? They they have, yeah. And of course, you know, you know a great a great game really. You, you know, everybody was kind of. You know, super, super. Um, you know, on the edge of their seats to the very end. Um, yeah, can't those last five minutes for something else. Yeah. Um, so, I uh, one of my responsibilities on Saturday, um, because the idea was we were having a load of people in um, in the stadium to watch the um, 
put the game on big screens. So these big screens were hired from a company called ADT, who do giant screens for horse racing and stuff like this. And I discovered that the screen we were using in the stadium was um, uh, the the, um, the 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 largest um, screen in the world. No, in Europe, they told me the largest screen in Europe. Um, and uh, oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Um, so here we go. This is that's very dark, isn't it? This this is that screen, um, and um, uh, oh, flip a look. Can you see that? Yep. Yeah, yeah, we can see it. So, so, so the only thing I had to play out to it was um, this is before the OB was ready. This was before uh, you know the feed coming back from uh, BT Sport was ready. The only thing I had to play out to it was was uh, Test Card F off my laptop. I had an HD copy of Test Card F on my laptop, and and so there it is. And so I left Test Card F up on these these Bally screens for you know a few hours and. Um, uh, until everything was ready to go. And I got a real wigging from both Sky and BT Sport at the end of the day because apparently the two news crews they'd sent down to do, you know, a little piece to camera. Oh, you know, look look how how um, how busy it is at the Emirates and, and you know, they're, they're, uh, they're ready for the, um, y- y- you know, this live thing they're doing on, on, on the screen. Um, yeah. And uh, and all all their camera crew saw in the background on these big screens was BBC Test Card F because the BBC weren't involved at all, <laughs> so it, it ca- caused some consternation and got me got me a telling off. But uh, no, it was a really really nice day and and w- went re- really well. The the new thing we tried, which we'd never really done before, was um, uh, super long fibre runouts for video over this new grade of double um, armoured fibre, which um, so so we we we, we wound up running. Oh, like a few kilometres of this stuff around the stadium, and um, for several different feeds, and it all all worked beautifully. And I saw I saw the players' bus run over these fibres a couple of times. I saw one of the OB trucks run over these fibres, and they they lasted, and they were really very good. So, it's it is the case that that you know fibre you know if done right can be very robust. So I was very pleased yeah. about that. Yeah. And what's what sort of cable? What sort of you said it was new, a new kind of fibre cable. What was new new about a new grade or? Yeah, so this is a new Draca cable, which is sort of double armoured. So traditionally, exterior rated fibre is is a Kevlar armoured cable to keep the flexibility in the cable, uh, and it's a loose tube cable, which is the best for sort of like long runs. Uh, and, yeah. and so you have you have the fibre contained in a little plastic tube, which is full of mineral oil, which improves the, the bend radius. So, so you, know, you can bend the cable, and the fibres are able to slip and slide around within that that tube because they're sat in a bath of mineral oil and then and then that tube is is armored in like a kevlar mesh same stuff they make um riot shields shields out of and then there's a, a zero a, a low smoke zero halogen jacket around the whole business but draco have just launched a new range of what they call os2 cable which has a steel um armor and it's more than just a, a steel mesh that runs down the inside of the cable. It's actually little steel plates that kind of coat around the inside of the cable. And it's kind of twice the price of, of everything else. But it's really very, very robust. You know, what, what lengths were you doing? So each of the, each of the um, runouts we made were 400-meter runouts. And each oh. one had four circuits in it. So, and, and one of those we had to sort of double up. So when we were testing them in the workshop, we had these four big runouts that we constructed. And we ran HDSDI one way down a cable into the next drum, into the next drum, into the next drum. So it's gone, it's gone 1,600 meters down four drums of cable. Then we doubled it back down the second circuit, back again, back again. So we were sending it six and a half thousand meters of fiber in the workshop. And looking at the eye pattern on the Tektronics, it was doing the same damage to the signal as about 20 meters of coax would. Wow. So you, you you know you really can run HDSDI long long distances, um, mm. which we're not used to running it over coax. You know, and of course you've got the Emirates Stadium to get round. So to go from the the OB area in the Emirates Stadium, which is what what, what baseband converters we're using for that? Uh, well, you can use any because uh, Simpty uh, two um, two nine seven M brackets two thousand six, which is the standard that governs it, um, is. Good, you know, is, is widely adopted. So we were using, in some instances, Black Magic, and in some instances, Miranda. Okay. Mix and, th- and match. Mix and match. They're all compatible with each other. And in fact, when we built NBC Universal a couple of years ago, their matrix, which was a an Envision matrix, had lots of optical outputs. But we terminated all of them in theatres and all that kind of thing with Black Magic. So they are all cross compatible. Cool. 
Oh, interesting. And then, and then the 4K aspect of the didn't didn't really come together. Didn't have enough time to make you know beat beat the cameras about and make them work. Um, mm. You know, so in the end, it was all just 1080i. And what <laughs> were you doing? Were you, were you doing that over 12G or were you used? I know there's fiber outs on those studio cameras, isn't there? Yeah, and and in fact they'll they'll run down any decent single mode cable. Uh, so no, but in the end, it was all just 1.5G HD stuff. 12G isn't isn't there yet, is it? Oh, it's not a ratified standard. Um, of course, uh, in fact, neither in is 6G. Uh, none of those ultra high definition television standards have yet to be ratified. Um, mm. Black Magic, fast and loose, democratizing digital video as they go. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. So um, the next thing, if, if nobody else minds, I'm going to plug straight on. The next thing I wanted to talk about was um, um, category 8 cable. Which sounds monstrous, doesn't it? It's been, it's been only a few years since we started doing, well, what everybody refers to as Cat Seven, but is really Cat Six A. So Cat Six A cable is a standard uh, where the the, the baseband um, um, performance of the cable is 650 megahertz. It's an analog bandwidth, and as a consequence, you can get 10 gigabits per second down it over 90 meters so for a 90 meter run out you can run 10 gigs per second over that cable um, uh, if we sort of spin back to earlier standards like cat 5 cat 5 e cat 6 they were sort of um, you know sort of a 22 megahertz cable which was good for 10 megabits per second and then by the time we get to cat 5 e which is a uh, 100 megahertz cable we're expecting 100 megabits per second to reliably go down cat 5e and if you kind of think about nyquist which is the um, standard that governs these things you think well how on earth do i get 100 megabits per second down a 100 megahertz cable so the rule is 2.2 .2. um you, you know you should have you know to go between the analog and the digital domains but you know, channel packing and and other technologies like orthogonal frequency division multiplexing allow for that to happen. And by the time you get to CAT6, which is a 250 megahertz cable, we're expecting a gigabit of data to reliably go down that. And then when we get to CAT6A or CAT7, depending on whether you're American or German, what you call it, um, that's a 650 megahertz cable, which we expect 10 gigabits to go down. We're now at the point where from March last year, this new standard, Category 8, was sort of launched. And that's, uh, you know, uh, depending on who you talk to, either a 1.6 or a 2 gigahertz cable. And we're expecting 40 gigabits per second to go down it. It's it's like those other standards. It's a twisted pair copper cable. Um, uh, like Cat 6A and Cat 7, it's what we call a, P a PIMF cable, pairs in metal foil. So each of the pairs, you know, the, the, the orange twisted pair, the green, the blue, and the brown twisted pairs are shielded in their own screens. And then the cable has an overall shield. Um, and so it's quite a stiff cable. And, mm, and, and, and they've gone beyond relying on, on the, you know, harsh twist ratios. So if you if you open up a bit of Cat5e cable and you look how much the the, the different pairs are twisted, the, of course the pairs are, are twisted differently. So each pair gives a different common mode rejection for noise immunity. Uh, and and when you get to Cat6 cable, they're twisted an awful lot more to try and give you a bit more common mode rejection. And um, by the time you get to Cat6a or Cat7, um, they've they've sort of they, 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 they don't rely so much on the common mode rejection and, they're, they're, and for noise immunity they're getting much more into the screening the cable to try and shield from what they call alien crosstalk so, and, and also inter-channel crosstalk between the pairs of the cable um, and they, they, they take this another step further with, with CAT8 um, so it, it, are, the, are the distances improved on anything or are they still very much the same? Well the rule is uh, you, you know and you, if you look at the TIA specs the rule is always that for, for premises cabling you should always expect just shy of 100 metres so 90 metres has always been kind of the standard for, 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 for proper data um, uh, distances and, um, and CAT8 is much the same they, they reckon that um, sending it over um, uh, 10 10 gig T going up to 40 gig T by the time the IEEE ratifies this as a, as a standard. The standard is going to be the TIA 568C standard. Um, they reckon that that, that 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 it will be 40 gigabits per second for Ethernet over 90 meters, which is I mean wow. phenomenal data rates, isn't it? Now, is, yeah. interesting. One of the one of the articles I found was very much. Was it Network World? I think they talk about very much 
this being a replacement for no it wasn't an article single point net yeah yeah so this article in single point network um let's just make that bigger is that they very much see cat 8 as not just being a data transport but also being for the um for the whole kind of home entertainment um uh you know dvb um uh, transport so so as you're transporting you know high definition content around homes cat 8 will be the way we'll do it it's kind of interesting. Now, I'm taking my guys, uh, Matt and Wesley, we're, we're off to a training day um, next month. So we'll know a lot more about it then, the sort of the physicality of it, the terminating practices and all that kind of stuff. And when we went between CAT 6 and CAT 7, the differences were very marked. It's all new tools. It's all new, you know, new test equipment. So, so I'll be able to tell you a bit more about it in, you know, you know, a month's time, probably two hangouts time. We'll talk a bit more about it. Yeah, I was going to say that, that cable doesn't look fun to run. No, it'll be like a hose pipe. You, you know, it'll be uh, yeah. hard to work with, I imagine. But you know, yeah. high data rates is where it's all going. Indeed, it's only going up. <laughs> the only way is up. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> cool. So uh, st still, still waiting on the Rupert. Still no sign of the horseman. Yeah. <laughs> He, no, he looks like he looks like he's in his uh, country retreat. That's right. He was he was telling from, us from uh, look at the roof. <laughs> before we started recording. He was telling us about why it's important to uh, to uh, castrate horses. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's 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 not exactly TV engineering, is it? <laughs> no, no. I believe that's someone else. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm just pop popping up on screen our, our YouTube channel where, where we drop all these things after the event. We sort of top and tail them and, and make them nice. And, uh, and uh, oh, look, there's, there's an ex-colleague. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and I still want to I still want to watch the first hangout you did, actually, because I, I missed all the, the whole Avid, Avid Anywhere talk um, that, was, uh, that was on there. I just wanted to hear everyone's opinions of it, really. Yeah, yeah, there's some good stuff on there. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, it's, it's, it's all, all up on the YouTubes. Um, the Route 6 blog as well, obviously, we, we, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that. It's, 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 where, it's where all this, uh, some of this stuff goes to live and die as well. Um, so uh, the DPP event from um, uh, last week or the week before um, with, uh, look, there's our, there's our good pal Simon Brett from uh, National Geographic Fox Channels. Um, uh, he presented at that, and so that's well worth a look at. Look at. Um, Media Composer version eight, something that we've been talking about um, on on the blog as well. And uh, this other product range uh, that we're very pleased we've um, we're dealing with the Antrica um, uh, uh, HD video over over network um, converters. Um, we're uh, we're putting together a, a sort of a compelling demo for doing uh, sort of Antrica and amulet over the internet so so at the moment matt's building a peli case with uh, with the appropriate zeisel um vpn router uh, uh, an amulet zero client their desk end box and an antrica um um decoder so we can rock up at a facility and so long as they've got a half decent bandwidth and the bit of software matt's been using to test for this is um jperf which is a, uh, a network analyzer, um, and at the other end, at Route Six West, we've got a we've got that running on a Raspberry Pi, <laughs> and, uh, and so right. we can do an instantaneous measure of UDP bandwidth between the facility we're demoing from and Route Six West over the VPN that the Zeisel holds up, and, and with yeah. that in place, it's then trivial to demonstrate um, <coughs> Amulet for KVM extension and um, Antrica for HDSDI extension. And with a half decent connection, like 10 megabits or better, um, we can do a very compelling remote editing demo with both an HDSDI monitor and a, um, a pair of DVI monitors and USB, etc. So, so that's something we're tickling along at the moment. We're starting to show it to people. And we'll talk a bit more about it uh, in, in, in coming weeks. But uh, it really is, uh, really is quite good for, for sort of remote desktop editing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's the. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how the, what the what the latency is like across the two. Uh, yeah, the two, you know, through the amulet and through the was it the Antrica? Antrica, yeah. Well, so so um, we've been very and impressed. And how the and how the, late, the how the latency will vary across both hardware, you know, platforms. Yeah, I mean, amulet is typically uh, eighteen milliseconds of latency plus whatever the internet puts in the way. You know, which is you know always up for grabs. But you know, in London, you kind of hope it's better than fifty milliseconds. Mm. You know, so that's kind of tolerable. Um, I, I, I wrote, I, I 
I banged on a little bit about Entropy on my on my blog a little bit. And um, um, what was the what was the encoding like? What's the encoding latency with the Entropy? Was it the Entropy is two frames of video. So right. So you so, so I, I had a couple of these these A two fifty PVM OLEDs up, and I had the Entropy running as a demo through that, and. Uh, you can just about notice it. Obviously, two frames is noticeable if you've got two monitors up. But, you know, kind of very, very usable for review and approval. And when you put it up against other manufacturers like, um, who are the other people? TerraQ. Uh, you know, they have a complete uh, MPEG GOP uh, of delay, which is at least 12 frames, maybe 15 frames, so half a second. So it then gets mm. difficult to kind of, you know, for, for people to make judgments and talk about it, um, you know, if you've got that bigger delay. And you think, mm. well, you know, if you are compressing these things, and you know, you've really got to compress them very hard to make them work nicely over the internet. Uh, surely there is going to be a big um, uh, latency. But Antrica seems to have got this very clever system whereby they, um, well, we'll go about it. We'll, we'll we'll bang on about it a bit later. But if you want to read about it in the meantime, I've written quite a lot on the Root Six blog. So there we go, Antrica video over IP encoders. I I'll think, check it out. I think I amalgamated that all into one big long article. Whereas on my blog it spans over a lot, so you can see some test footage, you know, some test pictures, and what mm -hmm. what you know what it does. And uh, am I right in thinking, Skeggs? Is that is that is that some event that you were involved in there? Uh, it might have been, yeah. I don't think I'm I'm parked up in a barrier in that one. <laughs> that's, that's you there in that crashed car. <laughs> <laughs> So what, there, I see there's a, is there a platform event coming up as well? Yeah, platform one, um, two weeks, I think it is. Okay. Uh, covering, uh, I think the theme is designing a flexible facility for the future. So uh -huh. with okay. um, stuff internal and external working, uh, a bit of DPP stuff in there as well, forecast deliverables, storage in the future. Um, yeah. So yeah, covering the sort of the hot topics at the moment. Okay, interesting. Where is it? Is it in London or? Yeah, it's at the gallery um, uh, oh, on Charing, Charing, Charing Cross. Cross. Yeah, I don't think Foils is there anymore, is it? That, I think they've moved from memory. But yeah, it's where they used to be, just opposite that. Okay, I'll, I'll see if I'm around. And I'm, I'm, it's my busy time coming up, though. It all starts two weeks. You won't see me for dust. What have you got? What have you got kicking off in two weeks, John? Oh, uh, festivals. Right. Okay. It's so like you are the multi-cam onset digital media acquisition man. Four, four on the uh, four, four weekends on the trot. I think is uh, June is looking like deep <laughs> joy. And then it sounds like I'm doing a bit of Wimbledon as well, but that's freelance. And, and this is round about when your baby's due. Is that right? No, that's not till the end of July. Oh right. Okay. <laughs> <Hopefully>. <laughs> I've got a nice month break. I, I, I sort of finish mid July and, and I don't crank up again for the last few till the sort of mid August. So there's a good four week window there, keeping that solid. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I might have to go soon, chaps. I've. Uh, Got to, I've got to dash off to work, unfortunately, but I'm, I'm at home at the moment. But what's what's next? I'd like to stick around for more. Okay, I was going to talk a little bit about um, uh, PSE. So, uh, yeah, go on. So I mean, PSE is kind of the other the, the other hard bit from the DPP, isn't it? You know, loudness and PSE. They're they're the kinds that gives people headaches, um, uh, and um, uh, you know everything else is just kind of traditional video QC, isn't it? But uh, so I've got up a, on screen a, a screen grab from from my phone, uh, and and you can see it's it's a BBC News report, and it's it's got this little uh, glyph on there. This video contains flash photography, um, and uh, if I um, uh, go back there and go there, there's there's an iPlayer uh, screen with a similar warning on it, um, contains flashing images, uh, and um, you know you can't you can barely watch any BBC material at the moment. Uh, without seeing um, reference to flashing material, you know, flashing images. You, you know, almost mm -hmm. every news report has a warning. And so what I've got here is, uh, in fact, I'm going to go back to the, the head of this document so we can see what it's called. This is the Ofcom document that governs all this stuff. It's uh, I'm on the wrong screen. Here we go. Uh, come on. So this is the Ofcom guidance notes. Harm and offence. So this is this is what Ofcom have to say, and it's all about kind of you know what you're allowed to show on telly. Most of it is sort of productions and stuff, um, you, you know about subliminal images, um, you know suicide, self harm, 
exorcism, the occult, you know, what, 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 they, what they don't want you to put on telly. But they have a section on um, flashing images, regular patterns in television, which we all know as, as PSE, photosensitive epilepsy. And, uh, and, and of course, the person who's, who's preeminent in this area is, is, is Harding. That's, that's what everybody thinks about when they think about flashing images. Um, but I'll just want to, you know, here's the, here's the specification that the Ofcom say we have to abide by. So a potentially harmful flash is when there is an increase or a decrease, i.e. an increase in luminance, followed by a decrease all the other way around, of 20 candelas per square metre, so that's a, that's a light level measurement, or more, um, yeah, between two frames. So this typically happens when you get par paparazzi flashes going off and you go from a, a normally illuminated scene to one that's almost bleached out because of the camera flash going back to a, a, you know the, the first style of image. And that's a flash event. Now, the, the first thing you might be thinking about, you might be saying is, well, hang on, how can, how can we know how bright the customer's television is at home? We're talking about 20 candelas per meter squared. We don't know what peak white on their television is, so how can we, we, we judge that? Well, Ofcom have a, um, uh, a, um, a document um, uh, that relates what they think is sort of standard um, video levels to domestic light levels. I'll just stick that... that, that um, Thing up here, it's that, um, uh, and you can see they say that a standard domestic television is peaking white at 200 candelas, and and there's our very traditional television gamma response, um, and, and so as a very 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 rough rule of thumb, um, uh, from that we determine that um, uh, their specification is actually asking us for no more than 10% luminance difference between two frames of video. And if, if there is more than 10% luminance difference between two frames of video, they call that a flash event. And then, then they go on to say isolated, single, double or triple flashes are acceptable. But a sequence of flashes is not permitted um, when the area of flash occupies more than one quarter of the display or there's more than three flashes within any one second period. So within 25 frames, if there's more than three of those flashes as defined, that's a no-no. Uh, and this is uh, applicable to overall luminance level, and it's also applicable to saturated red. That's all Ofcom calls for, you know. Um, now, Mr. Harding, who is well renowned as a as, as a PSE expert, his boxes test for an awful lot more than Ofcom require. Um, that, that, that his boxes test for regular um, patterning and lots of things which um, uh, you know aren't required by by, by law. Um, so you've got to say to yourself. You know, how on earth is any other manufacturer meant to compete with that? If you're Mr. Tektronix or Mr. Flash Gordon, who also make PSE detectors, or Mr. Vidchecker, who makes a software and PSE detector, how on earth are you meant to provide a Harding accreditation for a bit of material if you don't know what, in it. what, what Harding's yeah. testing for? It's, 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 you know, I think it's an iniquity that's been going on for far too long. Um, Very best, definitely. Now, rather splendidly, the... Um, the, uh, the DPP specification only says Ofcom. The DPP just asks for Ofcom. They don't say Harding, they say Ofcom. And so um, hopefully we're in a position where um, uh, you know, people won't be saying, you know, I need a Harding certificate with this. They'll just be saying, I need a DPP certificate with this. <laughs> no, I don't know if you heard that, but um, I've got the, uh, the clip. Um, let's just mute that because it's very noisy. I've got the clip of what, what caused all this in the first place. So um, stare very hard at your monitor and see if this does anything for you. Um, <laughs> this is an episode of Pokemon um, from uh, nine, the late 90s, and it's, it's the clip that supposedly put a lot of Japanese kids in hospital. So, um, so uh, I don't know how well you're seeing that, but it's the typical kind of Japanese anime nonsense. But we're just coming up on the shot now. That oh, look at that, very intense red and blue flashing. Yeah, man. that that was that. That's apparently that's that's the bogeyman. That's the thing that upset everybody, and and kind of started all this, um, uh, you know, well, PSC controversy look, ever since. Their faces, say, their faces say all. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because back in back in the days of post or my post, we used to always just adjust the the, the whites <coughs> down to a sort of a, a grey to get it past. Um, that's, that's what they're still doing now. You know, I was in an I was in an online recently for some content for London Live, and that's exactly what they were doing. They were just, yeah, you know, just adjust the chroma or the yeah, colour. Wind, yeah, wind down, wind down the luma, you know, a bit, and and crank up the blacks to some degree. And, yeah. Uh, 
and uh, you know, and, and uh, sorry, I'm, I, the, the other thing about you know the, the Harding test is this girl. It was it was a uh, it was an online they were doing for some food program. You know, she would she would be editing the sequ- you know, playing the sequence through, and she would play a. a, a a part of the sequence through the Harding, she just had the Harding running all the time, reading up time code from you know the sequence code and everything, and it and it would pass fine. But then she would go back and start playing out the program, and uh, that section would fail if you played the whole program through. But if you play that section through on its own, it wouldn't fail. She was pulling her hair out, and it was like she was really doing a nut in. Well, they insert insert edit. <laughs> Unfortunately, she was laid, she was laying off to an Azure key rack, so uh, oh, right. that wasn't that wasn't happening. <laughs> the joys of file-based deliveries, indeed. <laughs> Look at Pikachu; he looks horrified, doesn't he? Pikachu, yeah. I, cho- I choose which, you. Which, which one's that one? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> the 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 yellow electric mouse character is Pikachu. Can you name all of them then? Uh, well, at one point I could. Uh, uh, at one point there was a. Um, they, they, well, I think when they realised that the, the, the Steam was running out of Pokemon, they did in rapid succession three cinema films in a row, um, <laughs> and I had to take my kids to see all of them, and they were just appalling. They were terrible. Um, you know, they they really milked the Pokemon franchise for everything it was worth, and um, yeah, not good at all. Uh, the, yeah. the, the 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 thing. Ah, Rupert's back with us. Fantastic. He's a Pokemon man. <laughs> the world's on fire out there, mate. What's, that, what's happening? No, we just, so we're just, just talking about PSC and um, and the difference between Harding and, and Ofcom and and the fact that um, uh, the DPP spec calls for Ofcom and not for Harding. Um, I was going to relate... I was, I'm always very careful when watching Pokemon. <laughs> on that big screen telly I've got. <laughs> Yeah, I'm doing some training at NBC Universal in a couple of weeks, and, and I always make a point of playing the Pokemon clip full screen, you know, and I ask everybody to stare at it, and nobody once has ever had a seizure. But that's by the by. It's it's the kind of it's the clip that started everything off, and it's the you know the thing that was the problem. I find, um, I find, I, yeah, I find driving at speed down French French lanes with all those poplar trees at even even intervals that that can have an effect. Apparently, apparently that has an effect. Have you heard that? Yes, yeah, I can imagine that. I can yeah. I can I can, I can give you a thirty-seven and a half miles an hour in a Citroen DS. <laughs> Past all those poplar trees that Napoleon planted, that can that can engender PSC as well, allegedly. I can I can give a real world example of this. That where my boarding school was, there was a long straight road um, with um, uh, trees planted regularly down one was this side. This sort of abstruse punishment, Phil, that they'd, they'd administer. <laughs> and this road was supposedly a haunted road, a cursed road, and. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, every every summer there would be a disproportionate number of, of car accidents on this road in Shropshire, and uh, and it wasn't until somebody said maybe it's a photosensitive epilepsy effect, and they cut down every third tree, and suddenly the next summer there were no crashes, there were no accidents. There you go. Yeah, they exercised it. <laughs> so so the thing I was going to uh, mention was um, the first couple of years of Big Brother, we had a Gordon analyzer, which was the baseband. Um, cheapy analyzer for for PSE, you know, back 10, 15 years ago, and flash, yeah, flash and the, the the nice thing about that gadget was um, you play video through it and you give it a feed of time code from the Avid, and when, when Avid used to have time code, and um, and and when when it saw a flash, you, you know, a viral, well, do, can you get time code out the back of an Avid now? Yeah, you tick the LTC box, the digital cut tool. There you go. No, 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 at the, at the back of a, a Mojo DX or. or uh, definitely get out of nitrous. I'm not sure about the DX. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't think there is. I think you can get it. I, could, I think it's embedded though, isn't it? Out of the uh, out, uh, out of the HDSDI stream. Yeah. Def- yeah. There's definitely LTC on a on a nitrous. Right. Okay. Oh, okay. Fair enough. But but um, uh, so th- so the Gordon had a time code input, video input, and um, and if it saw. If it saw a PSE violation, it would freeze the timecode on the front display, beep a couple of times, and write the timecode into its log. And so the online editor could say, oh, flipping heck, this is a dangerous little sequence. And he could like maybe shave a couple of frames off the start and the end of the sequence. He could, like you've already said, bring the luminance down, bring the blacks up a tiny bit, until he just got under. And then he's off again, he's going again. And there's none of this idea of having to do an export at the end, having to do an analysis, and then two hours later, tell the online editor he's got to go and repair that shot. Um, so I thought I thought Gordon was a much more sensible, you know, from a workflow point of view, way of of tackling it. 
You could use both, I guess, these days, couldn't you? Yes. Now, there's one customer who we've been showing VidChecker to who um, their intention for VidChecker is to have it running on, obviously, on a server somewhere in their facility. And when they've got a PSE worry, they just mark in, mark out on their Avid timeline, export as source, so it's, you know, DNX media. And then the watch folder where they export it to, they have um, a PSE template pointed at that watch folder. And because it's only 30 seconds, it processes in no time at all. And uh, happy days. They get a report back saying, yes, it's wrong. Or, or, but but at least they haven't had to break their workflow and they haven't had to wait until they've laid the program yeah, off. Yeah. That makes sense. Seemed like quite a nice kind of way of going about things. So how quick would you expect to... Um, when you do that benchmarking test for probably another company, how long? What, what's the sort of average on a, on a reasonable processor? Time you'd expect if you dropped a little chunk of um, video in to get a PSC report, how long would you expect for the editor to wait before he kind of gets a sensible response? Well, I demo VidChecker a lot on my laptop, um, so I don't really know. Uh, but on my laptop, it's always you know in the couple of minutes while we're talking and having a cup of tea and, and chewing the fat, it's always finished. But uh, all my test material is kind of thirty-second clips, which I kind of suppose is is really what you'd be worried about. You'd be worried about a little ten-second sequence, wouldn't you? You know that, yeah. that that shot outside, you, you know the the event exactly. on the. So what do you do? You just you just make a quick you make a reference movie out of media composer into the watch folder and it picks it up. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, is that yeah. same as source reference? That's right. Yeah. And and so long as you've got the DNX import option on VidChecker, yeah, you, you're laughing. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. I, okay. I think it's I think it's interesting with the way the DPP are going though. Going with the Ofcom specs, I think that's, that's that's a good way forward. Yeah, exactly. Something that's everyone knows the known quantity. Finally, uh, old Professor Cashin will uh, <laughs> won't be cashing in anymore. Allegedly. Yeah. <laughs> Can't think what you mean. <laughs> oh, it, it is iniquitous, isn't it, that one manufacturer has managed to get a, a foothold. And nobody else can challenge him because nobody else knows what he does. And it's, it, that's why the importance of standards, you know. Pseudoscience. Yeah, I think ad hoc standards or ad hoc um, whatever are, yes, I mean, that's precisely why we have standards. That's why SIMPTE, you know, exists and provide us with the ability to say that that's it and everyone can stick to it. Who's a member of SIMPTE? Uh, Matt is. Good lad. Yeah. I wonder where those documents are going from. <laughs> so I'm just going to um, I'm just going to stick up a sequence of um, uh, what a PSE violating sequence looks like. You know, sort of three frames of. Uh, so just give me a moment to do the old screen share again. Uh, where are we? Screen share there. Start screen share. Go back to me. So so here's here's three frames. Uh, grabbed off a um, uh, a BBC News report. So so there we go. First one is when the royal baby was born. You can see the the uh, car pulling up outside the hospital, paparazzi flash, and then back to normal. So that, that's that's what that's what is a PSC flash event. And if you remember, we're allowed a maximum of three of those every second. Um, it's interesting that you think you think ten percent doesn't sound like an awful lot as the as the loose rule of thumb spec of luminance difference. But actually, although that picture looks pretty whited out, if you look at the histogram on the right-hand side of that, you can see that, well, maybe that's not as much as 10%. It is as it goes. That is a violation. But actually, you know, that kind of complete whiteout of the second frame, you know, is not as much video di level difference as you'd expect. I mean, it is no, it's not. No, not full frame or anything. Now there's no. a there's a yeah there's a thirty second commercial that I use when demoing VidChecker, um, and it's got lots of paparazzi um, sort of um, uh, stuff in it, uh, but actually none of the cameras when they did the shoot flashed and they put the flashes on in post and they're just tiny little kind of around the camera flashes. They look quite pathetic when you when you frame through the uh, the clip and look at them. I'll see if I can find that. It's quite entertaining. Um, uh, uh, uh. <clears throat> right, so I'll just go back to my shared screen and share the QuickTime player instead. This is all jolly clever, isn't it? This um, 
Google Hangout nonsense. Mm. Yeah, and it's all free. Yeah, yeah. No, no. If it's free, you're the product, Joel. <laughs> oh, yes. I don't see any advertising, though, on this, though. Ah. Uh. Apart, apart from your lower thirds. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, you're the product, mate. <laughs> so here we go. This is this is a standard def uh, commercial uh, PSB that I use for demoing VidChecker, and um, it's for it's for uh, a well-known brand of ice cream, and it's kind of a fake kind of Elizabeth Hurley kind. There we go. Look at that. Did you see that? <laughs> so you see the guy that the camera behind her left, the left of her localized, yeah. yeah. And then and then it's a it's a it's a it's a graphic, <laughs> you know, it's an effect of the flash. It's not a proper flash at all, and and so of course that that's never going to fall foul of PSE because that's much less than a quarter of the screen, and yeah. even though it's peak white, you know, it's a it's a it's a fake flash. <laughs> hmm. I wonder if that's um, I wonder if that's why they did it that way. Oh, I don't doubt it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gives a bit, a bit more control if you do it in post, doesn't it? Mm. There you go. There you go. Baggy trousers. Right, chaps. I'm afraid I'm going to have to go. I've got to go to uh, work. <laughs> <laughs> to speak. <laughs> yeah, you remember that. Um, it's been lovely uh, hanging out with you all. Very interesting. And I'll see you all soon. Jolly Cheers, good. Jolly. Join us again yeah, in a couple of weeks, Joel, yeah? Sorry, mate. Join us again in a couple of weeks, yeah? Yes, yeah, yeah. Send me an invite. It'll be, uh, I'll be around, definitely. For sure. And um, uh, have a lovely long weekend, everyone. Oh, sweet. Sunny. Take care. Take it Do easy. So. Bye. Bye. Now. We'll get sunburned. <laughs> oh, no chance of that. Bye. <laughs> um, so that's all the nonsense I wanted to bang on about. Um, at, pff, Rupert, what's, what's going on in, in the world of Route 6, this splendid company that we all work for? Well, there's all sorts of all sorts of fun and games going on this morning. So I, I was out for slightly longer than I was intending. Um, all th- all, everything everything suddenly kicked off. Um, I don't, I, you know, I haven't really prepared anything to talk about. I mean, I'm, as I say, I'm still kind of mildly um, obsessed by talking about Gamma and the way in which it's affected, you know, in and out of, of the various applications and color spaces that we deal with and the customers all wrestle with. But I think that probably requires a bit more uh, linear thought. Coming up soon in June, we've got the Platform One event where we're going to be getting together as per normal in the summer, a couple of days in Tottenham Court Road. Um, what date's that, Dave? Can you remember? Uh, two weeks' time, something like the 12th, 13th, one second, 12th, I can 13th, tell you. Anyway, check, check the website. We'll all be getting together. We can have all the various manufacturers that we represent um, and we'll do presentations to talk about you know, what, what the kit we're um, currently uh, selling does and how it can change your life. 11th and 12th of June. 12th of June. There we go. One so day, yeah. Sign up. Two, come two along. Days, single event. Yeah. Free lunch, both days. Fantastic. I've got it up on screen at the moment, but uh, that looks rather splendid, doesn't so, yeah. it? Yeah. We're going to be talking about the flexibility, you know, the flexible facility of the future, which in essence means being able to remote in and out. Um, yeah, you know, being able to access the equipment that you've spent all that money on from uh, places other than just the rooms local to it, and we'll be covering off, um, you know, various other aspects of. of um, sort of broadcast and post-production platform one there you go jolly good um now you mentioned gamma um i wrote i i, I blurbed on a bit um last week on my own blog which i will be you know banging on on the route six blog when i've just had a chance to sort of um finish off a couple of things i was stopped in the street by a friend um who's an engineer at a, at a big facility and it, it sort of his opening his opening thing was what do you set hd monitors to a gamma of 2.2 or 2.4 <coughs> And I immediately thought, oh, 2.2, doesn't everybody? And he pointed me at a Charles Poynton article that actually um, it's a bit more in-depth than that. It's a bit more, you know, sort of requirement. And and, and a, a specification I was unaware of from 2011, a, um, an EBU specification, 1886. Actually, if you read that and, uh, and, and you, you read about what Charles Poynton says, actually... For HD monitors, it is by no means clear. Rec 709, although it defines a gamma for what we call the optical transfer function, it doesn't define a gamma for the display. And actually, Charles Poynton, who is the king of uh, video color and those kind of things, his recommendation is that if it's an editing monitor in a brightish room, then 2.2 is fine. If you're in Mm -hmm. a controlled room with 
a monitor with a better dynamic range, like a grading room, then 2.4 is actually better. Um, and if, if that's kind of piqued your fancy, um, I've kind of got the maths on my blog, you can have a look at that, that, or in the next few days, that'll be up on the Route 6 blog as well. So I, I find that like a really interesting little investigation. Interesting. An opening gamma gambit. Yes, indeed. But we'll we'll talk a lot more about that um, uh, when we start, get round to why QuickTime um, knackers colorimetry sometimes. Well, I think that's, that's slightly overstating. I mean, what it is is that the, the expectations of the various applications vary significantly, and obviously the consequences of moving from one um, yeah expectation of you know where black and white is to a different one can have a significant effect on the camera. If you don't understand what's happening, it can become very confusing very quickly um, and you can rapidly lose your sort of sense of direction as it were so I think yeah we might we might revisit that and walk through a few examples jolly good well I'm out of nonsense to spout what about you guys hey I'm afraid I'm not I've, I've probably ought to get on with them in all the day which is backing up on me so I think that's probably uh, probably a, the, probably the lot for me indeed I'm, I'm off to well, ITN in a few minutes so uh, uh, should go. we call it shall I hold off ODA until another time uh, well, ODA. ODA, yeah. Can you give us a little five minute, a little 10,000 foot view, DS? Uh, yeah, well, optical uh, disc archive by Sony, um, which is the, the new sort of archiving. Not, well, I suppose it is a standard in a way that everyone's sort of talking about. I've got a quick PDF if I remember how to oh. share this. Screen share. I think quite a lot of people are using, or a lot of people, I think a number of people are using, um, they call it disk don't they in the sort of individual items so people are restoring or storing their data on professional disk which is effectively an xd cam disk in post-production clothing yeah exactly i think well there's, there's a lot of people out there that aren't fans of uh aren't fan, fans of tape mm -hmm. um, so can you see the speeds on it here and the sizes yeah. well, these are the, the sizes yeah and, and one of the, the sort of the headline is 1.5 terabytes per cartridge which is quite um impressive so it's a terabyte less than an LTO6, effectively. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you can have um, so in a in a if you go for a they do the standalone drives like this with the little cartridges, or you can progress down to the the library, which has uh, ten slots, I think it is, and two tape drives in it, um, and then you can actually stack these together um, up to five or six, I think it is, to make a petter site. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if there's any photos in here, there we go, like that. What's that? One, two, three, four, six. Yeah, six of them. So I mean, for sort of space-wise, it's quite compelling for for um, for archiving. But um, the speeds aren't aren't great. They list them somewhere here. Um, but I think real life experience is very very different. So they do a USB uh, three model, and then they also do a fiber channel. Um, Oh, here we go. So this is uh, the U is the USB. So the very first one was very slow. You can see here 200 uh, megabits per second. Wow. Um, second generation is 730. Um, I don't know if they mentioned the fiber one on here. No, I think that's it. I mean, it's it's quite yeah, it's quite attractive. Um, it's. And can you um? And you presumably need the Sony box to read them back in. Yeah, there's some software. Um, there we go. I forget what they call it. Um, but yeah, there's some third-party vendors that started integrating with it. Zendata have got a, mm -hmm. uh, 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 what do you call it, a um, uh, like a case, a white paper on on how they integrate with it. Um, but um, I think the speed currently is the is the challenge, and also you've got the the different platters inside the the cartridge of the discs, and then you've also got the the, the cartridge uh, speed change within the jukebox, so to speak, and I think that's where the um, sort of LTO is 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 quicker currently. Mm. Um, Interesting. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's not an open standard, is it? Not not as such, no. But well, I mean, their big what, claim what, is that it'd be what readable the to, on, on the on the ta on the disc where they. Um, it's uh, it's OF. There's a format that they talk. I wonder if they should. Oh, yeah. This is open platform. Yeah, there is something. Uh, Hollywood Film Archive, and there you go. 
Well, if it's good enough for them. Let's just see if I can find it on their website. Bear with. Because it's, yeah, ironically, it's an optical drive, isn't it? Wasn't the MO drive optical? Wasn't that the first optical drive? Then CD, then D, uh, DVD? Is that right? Uh, well, MO is yeah. magneto optical, so it's kind of a, a hybrid technology. Mm. Oh, UDF. There we go. That's what they. they, uh, they um, That's the file system, use. yeah? Yeah, which yeah. is universal disk format. Okay. And is that universal as long as you're Sony, or is that genuinely universal? Uh, good question. Optimized for ultra long term media archiving. Cartridge, cartridges have an estimated 50 year lifespan. So, I mean, that's the other um, USP they're going on. You know, they're promoting pushing rather than LTO, where you have to do your, you know, your migration from from version to version. Um, they're, they're a little bit more robust, I guess, as a, as a disc um, from storage and and from you know temperature and humidity rather than a tape. I think that's probably a um, a uh, a plus point. Um, yeah, they're a physical. Yeah, physical it'd be interesting item. to see how it moves. Um, but yeah, that was kind of my thought. Everyone's talking about it. That's 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 yeah the, the hot topic. Um, Interesting, and they, they presumably there are no moving parts as such, or a modest number of moving parts. I'm not sure of what the sort of the architecture is inside. Well, it's presumably a laser, isn't it, that reads the, the Blu-ray disc? Yeah, for sure, it'll be a, it'll be a long long wavelength. Um, yeah. Sorry, short wavelength laser. Um, Interesting. That's it. Ooh. Well, we, we to, if we can get one to tell. I mean, who's, who's actually got of um, the Zen Data guys got a library they're testing? Yes, they've got a USB uh, three, the later version, which is quicker. I don't know if there's fibre channels uh, shipping yet. Um, you, you're not. An, I mean, the USB three for standalone, or can you actually attach a library using USB three? I think the library is a fibre channel. Right. Right. Cool. Uh, oh no. Tell you not. So, yeah, you can get the USB and you can get a fiber channel uh, library. Yeah. Oh, I see. So, USB 3 replaces SAS in that scenario? Yes. So, you've got um, the ODS D77U, which is the USB, or the D77F, which is the fiber channel. That's quite interesting. Quite tidy. Yeah. You can get a library attached to a laptop. Well, not that you would, but um, theoretically, anyway. Library touch. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Or anything with a USB three connector. Hmm. Intriguing. All right, All right, gents. I'm afraid that's enough for me. Well done, everybody. Thank you, Phil. Yes. Um, Adios, compadres, and uh, we'll uh, we'll hopefully do it all again in two weeks' time. So we invite everybody to join us um, and uh, and talk turkey relating to broadcast tech, uh, you know, film and TV post production workflows, that kind of thing.